and how it could increase your risk of breast cancer, or does it really? And to do that, we're going to talk with Dr. Maria Sophocles uh, from Princeton, and then um, from 9.30 to 10, I get to talk to journalist Gary Tobbs. I love it. I think he's been on the show before. We're going to talk about his latest book, The Truth About Sugar. I'm Dr. Marina Curian. Stay tuned. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. You're listening to Dr. Marina Kurian on Dr. Radio. All right, you guys, we are back. And joining me for the next half hour is Dr. Maria Sophocles. She's the Medical Director of Women's Health Care of Princeton in Princeton, New Jersey. And welcome. Welcome, Maria. Thanks, Marina. I'm here. Thank you. Yeah, it was like delay. That's okay. Thanks so much for joining me. And we want to talk about... Um, some you know, I love how medical headlines can like create havoc in in across the country and across the world, right? Like all those breast um, cancer studies looking at risk of hormones, you know, postmenopausal hormones, you know, birth control. Like it's never ending. Um, and but That's what we want true. to talk it's about a-, a roller coaster. We're up. We're down. Take them. Don't take them. And now. We're back again to, hmm, maybe there's a risk. So let's let's talk a little bit about that. Um, want to talk? Want to start off with the study sure. uh, from the New England Journal? Yeah, sure. sure. I think the study you're referring to, the latest curve of the roller coaster, is uh, a study that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, a Danish study, and um, it came out in uh, well, the, the the New York Times sort of broke it in early December, and it reported. Uh, that they had tracked 1.8 million women and reported, and uh, this is an observational study, that there were more breast cancer cases among women who use hormone-based birth control methods um, than those who don't. And this made for wonderful media fodder. So Ronnie Karen Rabin on December 6th published in the New York Times uh, an article, you know, with the scary headlines that, that uh birth control pills and hormonal contraceptives can increase risk of cancer, as if this was new news. The fact is, it's not new news. We've known for decades that there is a small uh, increased risk of breast cancer from taking uh, horm- you know, a combination oral contraceptive pills. What was different about this study was simply that it showed that even on newer, lower dose preparations, that risk persisted. I think the really important things to understand from this are, number one, that you always, always, with news like this, can't just take one side of the story. You have to ask yourself, how do I balance the risks and the benefits? You know this as a surgeon, that any time we prescribe a medication or do surgery, we are weighing benefit versus risk. And same here. So any woman who's using hormonal contraception has to, of course, be informed about the risks and know them, but has to put them in perspective. First of all, based on your age, you know, if you're 20, your risk of breast cancer is extremely low just based on your age. Um, and also, you have to, you have to, as a woman, assess your personal risks and put them in the context of this information. Do you have family history of breast cancer? What are your behaviors? What are things you can do to lower your own risk of of breast cancer, and there are a number of things. Um, And how important is it at this time in your life to prevent pregnancy? Because that's actually its own very important health benefit. Um, And I think that, and and I think the article on December 6th by Ronnie Karen Rabin, she knew that it was inflammatory, so sure enough, on December 11th, just five days later, she wrote another article in the New York Times titled Birth Control Pills Protect Against Cancer Too. And uh, I think that's equally important. So um, without having a big monologue about this, I want listeners to understand that the pill, the birth control pill, has a very complex relationship with cancer. On the one hand, studies like the Danish one show a small increased risk in breast cancer. Other studies have shown potentially a 
an increased risk in cervical or liver cancer. Well, this all sounds horrible, except for the fact that cervical cancer is not a common cancer in developing countries, and it's easily diagnosed, um, and we see very little of it in the U.S. because of pap smears. Balance this with a decreased risk in endometrial and maybe colon and rectal cancer, as well as a really significant decreased risk in ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is one of those cancers that is really hard to detect and treat, and it's often diagnosed in late stage. So if you ask me if there's something that can lower the risk of a cancer that we don't have pap smears or mammograms for, then I say that's tremendous. And that decreased risk in ovarian cancer is 30 to 40 percent, and it persists for 10 or 20 years after you get off the pill. So you have to take the bad news with the good. Um, and I think if, if uh, listeners are not sure what to make with all this good news and bad news, they should make an appointment, go to a healthcare provider, and have them lay it all out. Yeah, and so one, one of the points that was made in a follow-up article from the New York Times was that the risk is very, very small. And again, this is the problem with all of the data that we've been presented, right? It's all observational, which means that they look at a population and they try to find variables that they have in common and then look at outcomes. And yet there's diet, there's, yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. And so it's not proof. So because this is a prospective cohort study, it wasn't adjusted for factors associated with breast cancer, like yeah. alcohol consumption mm-hmm. or physical activity. So if you Smoking. did a study on all women who are smokers, you probably have worse data than if you did on a study of all women who weren't smokers in terms of breast cancer risk in the pill. So, right, and that's what you're saying, I think. Yeah. Um, but so the yeah. study, it's showing that, uh, for the Danish study, that if you were younger than 35, there were only two additional cases for every 100,000 persons. Mm-hmm. So that means that there was one extra year. case of, yeah, one extra case of yeah, uh, breast cancer for 50,000 women 35 or younger who used hormonal contraception each year. So when you put it in that's that perspective... Right. So different it, ages pose different mm-hmm. risks. That's so cool. if, you're, if you're an 18-year-old girl and you have horrific periods and you're missing school and you're an athlete and you can't participate because your periods are heavy and painful, should you stop the pill? No, you shouldn't stop the pill because it's it, it's not that you're you're not really putting yourself at high risk for breast cancer. Your your risk, uh, your quality of life and your health are probably better being on it, especially at that age. Um, if you're 45 and your periods are rocky and you're using this to smooth out periods and get yourself to menopause, which many of my patients do but you have a high risk of breast cancer for other reasons, perhaps there's another alternative for you. Um, another thing in that article that I liked is, is uh, it said for every 7,690 women who use the pill, one will have cancer and 7,689 of them will not. So I like to just picture a stadium with those 7,000 women and realize that almost every single person in the stadium will, will not have cancer. Yeah. And uh, due to so, taking birth control, right, I completely ba- based agree. on based on those numbers. So, I think uh, you know, like you said, it is definitely a risk benefit analysis, and it's unfortunate that we have these headlines that are, you know, both ways. It's so it's just you know, my next half hour I'm going to be talking about diet, and again, that's been all over the mm-hmm. place. It's just unfortunate that we have such sensationalism to interpret the data, and I completely agree with you that patients, people who are concerned, should go and talk to their doctor. And yeah, try and get well, the in, this, in GYN, this started in 1992 with the publication of the first data from the Women's Health Initiative, a right. massive study yeah. looking at hormone use and risk. And it, the headlines came out in 1992 that said, oh, hormones are bad, they cause cancer and stroke and heart disease, and suddenly every talk show host was talking about them, doctors stopped prescribing because they were afraid of being sued, patients stopped taking them, and it was all 
very, very much uh, exaggerated and overblown. And the WHI is still going on. So every few years we get another tranche of data. And the truth is it has been mixed. Some has been bad news, some has been good news. But the upshot after all the dust has settled is that we use hormone. We continue to use hormones in gynecology, but we use them in different ways. All that research has shown us is that we can't just use them for everybody ad nauseum at any dose forever, which makes sense. So we've learned, for example, that transdermal estrogen is probably safer than oral estrogen uh, postmenopausally. We've learned that we don't really want to keep women on more than 10 years. We've learned that we want to control the doses and use the sh- lowest dose for the shortest amount of time just to control symptoms. So all of these management guidelines sort of were born from a lot of histrionic <laughs> headlines uh, that erupted from from data. But, uh, you know, I guess this isn't unique to women's health care. It's just that women are the information gatherers for their families. The women are big readers of, of, of health information and listeners to programs like this. So, yeah. I would say, importantly, know your source of information. If it's your friend or your cousin or your sister. Or the Internet. Wonderful, <laughs> and they may care about you, or the Internet. But be aware that anybody can publish anything on the Internet. And um, so I send my patients often to the um, North American Menopause Society's website. I think it's menopause.org. Now, that's specifically for care of a menopausal patient, but we have a lot of perimenopausal women in their 40s who use birth control pills and still need birth control uh, implants and IUDs. So there's a lot of really good data on that that site. Okay. So, I want to take a caller. Yeah, we have a caller. Yeah. Uh, Robin is calling from Georgia. And again, if you guys who are listening who have questions for Dr. Maria Sophocles, please give us a call at 877-NYU-DOCS, 877-698-3627. Robin, uh, welcome to Dr. Radio. I'm Dr. Marina Curian. And as you just heard, Dr. Maria Sophocles, what is your question for us? Yes. Um, good morning. My question is um, my daughter is 22 years old. She's been on the pill for a couple of years now, um, low estrogen uh, birth control pill. And um, I am a six-year uh, breast cancer survivor. However, it just came back um, as stage Sorry, four metastasis. Um, it's not breast. It's now in other parts of my body. Um, so my question is, does she need to be concerned that since her mother had breast cancer, she should not, she might be a candidate for it, she might have it, um, should she not be taking the pill? Just uh, a little concerned about that. Sure. So I alluded to this uh, earlier that what she should do, well, first of all, it's important to know your family history. And we live in an amazing era of um, genetic diagnostics where it, it may behoove her to go to a genetics counselor and share her entire family history and all the data she has about your cancer, uh, age at diagnosis, your mother, your sisters, kind of, uh, you know, other relatives who may have cancer, making sure there's not a cancer syndrome or a genetic predisposition. But remember, 80% of all breast cancers are not linked to genetics, um, which I think most people find surprising. But nonetheless, I think it's important that she knows her, her whether she, based on family history uh, and, and possibly genetic testing, has uh, a gene that or genes that will increase her her risks. And if so, then that's all right. It's better to know it and have increased surveillance with breast imaging and exams. The second point is that she should look at her lifestyle and, and changeable factors, things she can change for the rest of her life that can affect her risk of breast cancer, alcohol consumption, smoking, physical activity, um, breastfeeding. She's 22, but if she, studies show if you have children before the age of 30, you lower your risk of breast cancer. If you breastfeed for any duration of time, and the longer you breastfeed, the better, you are lowering your risk of breast cancer. Um, so there are a number of things that she can incorporate during her lifetime that will make uh, small improvements in her 
de novo risk. I mean, things you can't change are your age, right? Breast cancer risk increases with age. But hopefully as she ages, uh, there'll be better imaging and better abilities to detect early breast cancers. We already have made progress in terms of having 3D mammography available which seems to detect earlier cancers better. Um, there's an enormous amount of research being done on better imaging and on um, biomarkers, and I think in her lifetime there'll be a lot of opportunity for her. The most important question you have for me today is, should she get off this low, low estrin? And I would say that depends. Is she on it because she's sexually active once in a blue moon? Um, if so, maybe she doesn't need it. Um, is she on it for debilitating painful periods and she's tried uh, ibuprofen and it's not enough and um, things like that? Then no, I'd say maybe she should stay on it. Um, mm -hmm. So I do have two questions. It depends on her I... and her needs. Go, go ahead, me. Robin. Um, so, what age do you suggest she starts getting mammograms? Well, that that depends on how, you know, if your breast cancer was diagnosed under 50, right? Were you under 50 when your breast cancer was diagnosed? Yeah, I was 49. 49, so about 50. So, uh, I mean, there is a rule of thumb that we have women start getting mammograms five years before the earliest breast cancer case in their family. But she's nationally going to start at 40 anyway. So I think she's fine to start at 40. If you had gotten your breast cancer, let's say, at 38, then we want her getting her first mammogram at 33. You see what I'm saying? But she doesn't need to start before she otherwise would. So she can start at 40 like everyone else. It's fine. I like that. I mean, I think the best, uh, I mean, you've made wonderful suggestions, uh, Dr. Sophocles, so, but I like the idea of going to the genetic counselor to have, um, you know, a, a look at her, a risk assessment. Understanding. Yeah, yeah, understanding of her risks. And it may extend beyond breast cancer, and that way the genetic counselor can even outline, hey, it turns out you have family members with colon and rectal cancer. You you may need earlier colonoscopy. Um, genetic counselors provide an enormous amount of information. It's one visit. It's it's covered by insurance. And, um, you know, they... And if some genetic predisposition is found out, people worry, oh, I won't be able to get health insurance or something like that. That's not where their worry should focus. I think they should be relieved that now their health care plan will cover more and appropriate surveillance. So, for example, if someone has an elevated risk of breast cancer, they may be eligible to have breast MRIs paid for, which are extremely expensive, mm -hmm. but are really superior to mammogram for, for evaluation and detection of breast cancer. So we don't use MRIs as screening because they're too expensive. But if you have a high risk, you will be screened and, and evaluated with mammo and breast MRI. So yeah, I think the genetic counselor is a place for her to go. Thank you so much for calling, Robin. We're going to Karen from Texas. Karen, welcome to Dr. Radio. What is your question or comment for us? Hi, well, thank you for taking my call. Um, this may be a little silly of a question, but um, just a little history. I'm, I'll be 65 this year. I pretty much flew through menopause, pre-menopause, very little symptoms. Um, I don't really have any symptoms now that I'm in menopause except maybe vaginal dryness. Um, I feel pretty good. Um, I just didn't know y'all are talking about hormones. Is there anything that maybe I should be taking? Just because, uh, that, that's a good age. question. That's an excellent question. And and until the 90s, many clinicians felt there was something magical and life prolonging about hormones, and that we should maybe put them in the drinking water or give every woman hormonal replacement therapy, and that would keep her skin young and her arteries clean and keep her vital. And I still have patients who will come to me at 85, and they've been with their doctor for 30 years taking postmenopausal hormonal therapy for that long, and they love it and they don't want to get off of it. Um, the current thinking is that we only use menopausal hormone replacement therapy to treat symptoms. Um, 
In terms of vaginal dryness, that is not something you need to take systemic hormonal therapy for. Uh, there is vaginal estrogen available as well as non-estrogen products. There are lubricants and moisturizers like Replens, um, Luvina, uh, things like that that will help with dryness. There is even um, a, a non-medication option now. Um, one of the things I pioneered in this country is the use of uh, laser to regenerate vaginal tissue and blood flow. And people love that because there's no medication at all and it's painless. What, what's it so called again? For, the, it's the, like a, a nice name. The vaginal. Yeah, Mona Lisa Mo, touches the yeah, brand. Mona Lisa. Name, I knew but it was something. It, yeah. But, um, but what it is, it's a CO2 laser. In fact, I trained a staff at NYU on this. Um, and it was invented in Italy where I used to live and um, brought here, FDA approved in 2000, uh, end of 2014. So to date, we've treated something like 80,000 women worldwide with this, and it's really very promising. There are 30 published studies out on it, but you know we still need long-term data. Uh, it seems to be safe and effective. Mm -hmm. Um, right now, it's not covered by insurance, so that's sort of the rate-limiting step for it. But I hope that's something in the future insurance companies will consider covering. So for, for the caller, if vaginal dryness is your most pressing symptom or your only symptom, you do not need to be taking anything systemic. But you should go to your gynecologist, and uh, what you can tell her is I learned on Sirius XM that I have probably something called GSM, genitourinary syndrome of menopause, which just means a loss of estrogen in the genitourinary tissues. And what can you do for me? What options are there for me? And uh, that, you know, and if, if, if you don't want to take a medication or you don't have a practitioner who has this laser, then you can use uh, moisturizers and lubricants to, to help with, with intercourse. Jennifer, I mean, uh, Karen. Does that thank, answer your question? Yeah, Karen, thank you so much for calling in. I hope that, that that's helpful. We're going to Jennifer from Arkansas. Welcome to Dr. Radio. What is your question or comment for us? Uh, I am uh, 60 years old, and I had a hysterectomy seven years ago, a complete hysterectomy. Uh, and mm -hmm. my doctor put me on primarium at the time. Since over that seven year period, he got me down to the very lowest dose. But he has kept me on it due to, uh, I have osteoporosis, and he said mm -hmm. there was some benefit there. Um, yes. I, can start, I, I trust him completely, but recently, well, a year ago, I had an issue with my heart, or they thought I was, and uh, while I was in the hospital, one of the doctors that saw me thought I might have a blood clot with my symptoms. And Ooh. so they did testing. He said, since you're on primarium, you very likely could have a blood clot, what scared me to death. And so since then, that's I think the he's right, and I think that uh, osteoporosis is benef there is a benefit to treating osteoporosis with estrogen. But we now have many effective non-hormonal treatments for osteoporosis um, that that will not increase your risk of clot. The Premarin will; it does. So if you truly had a heart problem, and I, I don't know the you know, the specifics of it, but if there was any talk of potential clot, I, th I think I would get off the Premarin. First of all, you don't want to be on Premarin anymore anyway because it's oral. And if you remember earlier in the program, now the um, current thinking is that it is safer for you if you're going to take estrogen and you don't need progesterone. You only need estrogen because you have no uterus. So you should not be using an oral preparation. You want to be using a transdermal preparation that's a patch or a gel. So if you must stay on estrogen, please at least convert to the patch or the gel. And, um, you know, you may not need to be on it at all because a rheumatologist or your gynecologist can discuss with you non-hormonal alternatives to treat the osteoporosis. Okay? All right, Jennifer, I hope that's helpful. Definitely make an appointment to talk to someone. Are you talking, uh, Maria, are you talking about like Fosamax and things like that? Yeah, Fosamax was the first, and now there are actually even much more progressive and effective uh, meds than Fosamax, and they're super well tolerated, one pill a month or yeah. one injection twice a year, things like that. Um, and that way she doesn't have clot risk, because if there's any, you know, if she's been out for seven years, 
um, she she's probably not having hot flashes or anything like that anymore. I don't know, but um, but any kind of clot risk, you don't want to, you know, taunt, you know, you don't want to test the situation. Um, and she shouldn't be on an oral anyway. Her doctor, I mean, the patches have been out for decades, so yeah. she really should be converting to that. Yeah, but Fosamax, Prolia, Boniva, Boniva is there's, there's many of them. All right. Yeah, there's lots of them. Mm-hmm. Let's take another call. Alex from Ontario. Welcome to Dr. Radio. What is your question? Again, I have Dr. Maria Sophocles. I'm Dr. Marina Curian. What do you have for us? Good morning. Thank you. Um, I'm 49 and perimenopausal, so I'm still getting my periods sort of regularly off and on. I have been uh, tested for uh, my hormones. I have a very low progesterone and DHEA, and I'm wondering, my question is, um, my gynecologist wants to put me on bioidentical DHEA and progesterone, and I'm wondering how, if there are any risks for heart problems, heart disease with risk factors in on my dad's side, um, or is it safe to take them? Okay, excellent, excellent question. And bioidentical, that term has become super popular. It's right up there with kale and quinoa and fr- juice pressing. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and acai. Okay. I love fresh, fresh juice. <laughs> Yeah, and acai, right, which I, I love. Um, bioidentical, let me teach you guys what that word means. I was an English major, so I love words. So bioidentical is short for biologically identical. That just means that it's anything whose chemistry is the same that's in your body. For example, Premarin, like the last caller who's taking Premarin, that's a non-bioidentical estrogen. It's made from all different types of estrogen, but not those that exist in the human body. So it'll fix symptoms, but you're not putting back into your body what used to be in there. Whereas other formulations that are made by big drug companies and FDA approved, um, are bioidentical. For instance, estrace is a bioidentical vaginal estrogen. It's made of estradiol, which is the same thing your ovaries make or used to make. But in our country now, the term bioidentical has come to mean something supernatural and holistic and you're safer and healthier on it. You may be safer taking something that's bioidentical, but it doesn't have to be made in a lab. It doesn't have to be ordered through your clinician. It, it, there are many things that are bioidentical that are right in your doctor's drawer of samples, for one. Doctors who draw a lot of hormone levels, I'm always a little suspect of because the truth is now we use hormones to treat symptoms, not to treat levels. So if your progesterone is a little low at 49, congratulations, you're normal. That's normal. We, we, we expect it to be a little low. Mm-hmm. Same with your DHEA, same with your estrogen. Um, Remember, these numbers fluctuate all the time, especially at 49. So the value of a single blood test is pretty worthless. It's really not the way you want to be managed. You want a doctor who's treating you. Well, let me just say, I don't think you need the DHEA and the progesterone. I don't. So I'd ask you, what is he or she treating? What symptoms are you bringing to that doctor that need improving? If you feel fine, other than your irregular menses, you don't need to take anything, and you shouldn't. And you shouldn't have a clinician be drawing blood levels and convincing you to take sup- supplemental um, hormones, especially if they're terming them bioidentical. So be, be very careful about doing that and understand that bioidentical is, um, is something that can be custom made or just made by a big drug company. Did that help, Alex? We did, and if I was to take them, are there any risks for heart disease? Are they good or bad? Or Well, um, it's not that they're good or bad, okay? It's not, it's not no, no cardiologist in the country would prescribe either of those to prevent or lower your risk of heart disease, nor would they say, I want you to get off They'd say, if you have risk for heart disease, let's look at your family history, at your cholesterol. So it's an, an, it's neither, okay? All right. Thank you so much, Alex. Dr. Sophocles, well, this is a fast half hour. We are out of time here. Um, I so know. Wanna, yeah, we really well, thank talked. You. We yeah. covered a lot. You should come mm-hmm. back on. We could talk more. And I love, I actually did have uh, someone who wrote the book on bioidentical hormones. I'm uh, blanking on her name. Ricky, Ricky something, I think. Uh, 
I don't, I don't, oh, anyway. there are so many out yeah, there now. Yeah. But it's a fascinating topic, and it's it also is. been really media-hyped. But and Marina, I, thought, I would love to come back. Thank you so much for having me thank on. Thank you for joining me again. Dr. Maria Sophocles, Medical Director of Women's Health Care of Princeton. Uh, it's a women's health practice in Princeton, New Jersey. Thank you so much for joining me. Stay tuned, you guys. We do have to go to break, but when I return, it'll be with Gary Tobbs and his new book, The Truth About Sugar. Uh, and we will be back in a couple of minutes. I'm Dr. Marina Kurian. <laughs> 